This episode of the Sloopcast is brought to you by the Mad Canadian Barbecue Company. Mad Canadian Barbecue Company is an Ohio-based company where they usually say our seasoning will take your barbecue from good to great. With the great three box sets that that Mad Canadian has over at the madcanadianbbq.com, such as the Just Send It, the Sweet Heat, and the Whole Hog, can't go wrong with any of these seasonings for for the holidays here, probably too late to get it for Christmas, but probably, but start off the 2020 new year, right. With any of these three great sets. Um, Matt Kennedy also wants us to let you know that on January 2nd to stop out at the Finley crafted nano brewery from two to nine o'clock for some delicious barbecue and their beer release. Again, that is January 2nd at the Finley crafted nano brewery. Med Kenny Barbecue Company, where they have your butt covered. This episode of the Sloopcast also brought to you by the Iron Bean Coffee Company. The Iron Bean Coffee Company is an Ohio-based coffee roaster. They're a micro roaster. They're a hand batch roaster. They're a small batch roaster. They're a roast-to-order roaster. They're a marine-owned roaster. Oh, I almost got through all that. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. USDA organic. Roast to order. Fair trade certified. Marine owned. Ohio owned. Mom and pop literally owned. Everything you could. Oh, by the way, the coffee is really good. (laughs) Did did I point out that the coffee is really good? You, You can find all of this and a whole lot more at ironbeancoffee.com. That's Iron Bean Coffee, America's local coffee roaster. Going on YouTube? What's going on YouTube? Uh, If we run into any technical difficulties this particular episode, please forgive us. We are running a brand new setup. So... Hopefully all goes smooth. Why would we wait till now to do this? Or why wouldn't we wait a few more weeks to do this? These are all great questions. But we're running a brand new setup. A brand new room in my house. A brand new computer. Brand new recording software. Brand new everything. Because I'm stupid. (laughs) I made all of the changes at once. I'm also still working on my monitor setup, so please forgive me if I'm looking down here or over here a little too much. Still working on the layout. So uh, forgive our dust as we make improvements. All right, let's get into the show here. Absolutely. We've got barbecue back here. You're all invited. Welcome to... The Sloopcast, how are you doing today, Kyle? Doing pretty okay. Pretty okay. <laughs> pretty okay. <laughs> Ohio pretty State's okay. in the playoffs. Yes. Ohio State is in the playoffs. That is the good news. We've been telling you guys for weeks, win and in, win and in. Oh, what if mm-hmm. we look bad against Northwest? It doesn't matter. You know what? They oh, look, what they if look- this and what if that? That doesn't matter. Ohio State gets it done 22 to 10 over the champions of the big northwest northwestern wildcats fitting <laughs> yeah not uh not ohio state's best game of the year uh, no, a lot of credit definitely, definitely justin field's worst game of his career at ohio state for sure uh, 114, had- 114 yards two interceptions 44 percent completion for a buck 14 he, this Could is his first time. This his is wrist. his first time ever at Ohio Can, State, where he had zero points. He had zero Can, touchdowns, no rushing touchdowns, no passing touchdowns. Never done that at Ohio State. Can we please but acknowledge yet, that he hurt his thumb slash wrist? Yes, he did. But I think we found we found we found our running game now. Trey Sermon, Trey Trey Sermon, twenty nine rushes. For 331. Insane. Again, ridiculous, ludicrous. 
I mean, <laughs> he went flat. <laughs> he went flat. <laughs> I mean, this was one of the top rushing defenses, and you can you can argue if the teams Northwestern played okay, but statistically, one of the best rushing defenses this year. And Ohio State had almost 400 yards rushing against them. And made it look easy at times. Oh, Trey Sermon made them look like a JV team at times. My goodness. A little, a little bit of love for the slobs. I know, like Trey Sermon. Yes. Like, I'm going to come up with some sort of Sermon pun, and that's going to be the name of this episode. Trey Sermon's going to be in the YouTube thumbnail. I don't want to take anything away from Trey Sermon. Okay, I promise you this. He's he's going to be the lone feature of the YouTube thumbnail. I'll come up with some sort of pun for the episode name. It'll all be about Trey. But before we go too far down the holy crap Trey Sermon, just a little bit of love for the guys who are blocking for him. Absolutely. It was their first game together in over a month. It had to have been over a month because they were since the Indiana game because they weren't together during the Michigan State game. Nope. Ha- over half of them were out. This is the first time in over a month that they played a a legit football game in a competitive environment. It, yeah, was, it was a little rough, definitely a little rough at the beginning. <laughs> but as the game went on and definitely saw that in the second half, things really started clicking. Uh, the the slobs really getting their Blocks uh, solidified the wide receivers. Oh, oh man, the wide receivers making really, really good blocks to open those those lanes for Sermon as well. Yeah, uh, it was overall an amazing game outside of the passing game, which is weird <laughs> because but- at the beginning of the year we were worried about the defense, and the defense didn't have a spectacular game but they hold Northwestern to 10 to 10 points and of course we were worried about the running game and as it turns out that that was okay <laughs> on on a Saturday so yeah mm-hmm. it's 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 all backwards from where we were not too long ago so the focus from here on out for the next two weeks will be the health of obviously Justin Fields, Mm -hmm. but we also had a master Teague injury. Mm. So we're, we're, we're giving our discord another shot here to do live, live recordings again. (laughs) You, you, you phrased that as if they messed it up the first time. No, no, we, we did. (laughs) We did. We didn't have the computing horsepower to do it. Brawley's listening in here and he says, Trey hundred yards. Trey hundred. Ooh, Trey hundred. God, that's the first time we had a, a sloop cat name an episode. I think Trey hundred yards. Yes. I like that. Thank you, Brawley. <laughs> I was, I was thinking sermon on the, like I was going to some sort of like sermon on the Mount, maybe like sermon on the March. That's what mm-hmm. I was thinking. Trey hundred yards. Trey hundo. Something like that. So let's see here. Statistics. Statistics here. 513 yards for the game. Yeah, just a yard shy of 400. 399 rushing yards. Average 9.1 for the game. And if if you look at, if you take out Justin Fields, his rushing and sacks and all that, the running backs, all three of them, Trey, Master Teague, and Mayan Williams all averaged over 10 yards a pop. (laughs) That's slightly misleading for Mayan Williams. One attempt for 10 yards? That's 10 (laughs) yards. (laughs) Of course, Master Teague only had two carries, but... For over 10 yards a pop. (laughs) Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, uh, so one of the things we have to ask ourselves... How big of a deal was it losing Chris? Well, okay. What was wrong with the passing game? Is it all on the wrist injury? Do we know exactly when in the game that wrist got hurt? What What do we know? What don't we know about that? Well, the offensive line, 
had a really good game pass blocking, didn't yes. have the best game, or excuse me, they had a really good game run blocking, didn't have the best game pass blocking. That plays in. The injury to Justin Fields' wrist plays in. Not having not having CO2, not having Chris Olave plays in. Northwestern playing a complete cover four shell and just not allowing anything deep to happen, playing a very disciplined deep shell. How much of that plays in? Mm -hmm. Because the defense Northwestern was running against Ohio State was the exact defense that I was saying Ohio State needs to run when they make the playoffs and they have to play Clemson or have to play Bama, which I still believe mm -hmm. that is absolutely what you should see Ohio State basically take the what Northwestern did to them. They basically need to watch that tape. And then implement their own defense to do that against Clemson. Yeah, Go, it's a that's a straight up NFL defense. Allow nothing big over top. Force them to go seven, eight, ten, twelve plays to get all the way down the field, and, let and them then make, just and hope let them make that the mistakes. Hope that a mistake happens. Hope mm -hmm. that there's a pass play that is missed, but it was missed so bad that it's a backwards pass, and then boom, you lose eight yards. Mm -hmm. That there's a sack. That there's a holding play something and it just puts the offense a little too far behind the chains and they can't recover because you're playing your deep shell and they end up punting which is what northwestern did to ohio state which is what like i said ohio state should attempt to do against clemson and alabama should they get that far because you're not going to stop either of those offenses no you, you gotta you gotta keep up you gotta you got to score. You got to score a lot of points here. And from what we saw in this game, definitely, definitely a lot of things to work on here. Getting CO two back definitely will help. Yep. Um, now, one of the things I kept seeing, and it's hard for me to agree with this. I'm not saying that the people are wrong, but I have a hard time agreeing with it. Is that Fields was really trying to push things, trying to really make things happen when they aren't. Let's, let's look at his, his two interceptions there. He had right. his, fir his first one into the end zone. That was a heck of, that was a heck of a play by a, that red shirt freshman. That was he not a bad decision. Not that a bad, bad decision. It was a heck of a, it was a heck of a throw there or a heck it was of also, a catch. It, it wasn't the best thrown ball. That ball should have been further to the sidelines and a little higher. Mm -hmm that they should not be in position to make that play. If you mm -hmm. look at Garrett Wilson, Garrett Wilson's like reaching behind himself. His body momentum's taking him to the corner of the end zone, which is where that ball should have been. The ball should have been a little higher, yeah. a little deeper, a little closer to the side. Mm -hmm. wasn't a bad choice. No. It just wasn't his best ball placement. And again, does that or does that not have to do at the wrist? I don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't really know yeah. the severity of the wrist injury. We don't, I don't even think, like I said earlier in the show, I don't think we really even know when it happened. No, we, we don't either. And the and other interception his, that was, I, I'm not going to really put the blame on him because that's the type of, that's where Justin Fields throws that. That's where Olave goes. Yeah. If you watched, if you watch that broadcast, Joel Klatt nailed the breakdown mm -hmm. of what happened on that interception. Yeah, he he um it, that was it was so oh, nice was having Joel Klatt and and Gus Johnson back by the way. Yes, it's so good. It was so nice. Who, Just, who was that? Was that um who was that that cut back? I'm I'm trying to remember who that was. It was Juice, wasn't it? Yes, it was it was Williams. Yeah. Instead of cut, keep cutting to, back or coming back to the the um sideline to the sideline thank you 
he he just kind of gave up and started going upfield then when Justin Fields expected him to continue to go there. So I'm Guys. not going to I'm not going to put the blame on Justin Fields there too. Now there was a lot of if he throws like I think it was in the first half too or the first quarter where he was starting to get tackled and he just kind of just throws it. Hopefully somebody catches it. I could, that would easily could have been an interception there as well. I, Very, there's always plays that could have been or should have been. And mm-hmm. I mean, Ohio State nearly had a pick six in the first half, but it was just a little too low. Was it for Proctor? Is that who almost had that? I don't remember, but it would have been six had he been able to snag it. But he yes, couldn't. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that was Proctor. Yeah. He did end up getting, he ended up, um, getting a turnover. I think it was like the next drive or two drives later. Was he the one that forced the fumble that Hilliard, by the way, Hilliard had an amazing game that Hilliard ended up recovering. Is that right? I think so. I think you're yeah. right. Hilliard may have won the game for Ohio state that interception and then later with the fumble recovery had a couple really great, just more standard defensive plays right when Ohio state needed it most. Mm-hmm. What are you smiling at? Oh, our, our lovely sloop cats just giving us a hard time. That's all. About what? <laughs> oh, they're just being the sloop cats. Uh, fair enough. They're just being the sloop cats. Uh, well, now you're just making me paranoid. <laughs> you're all good. Okay. You're all good. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, good things about Sermon. We talked about bad things about Fields. He was 12 for 27. Uh, only four players caught the ball. And only two of those four were wide receivers. Zero tight ends. Yeah. Fleming had four catches, which this was kind of Fleming's coming out party. Didn't start off all that well. I think he had like, that dropped past the very first play and he had a couple of other mishaps here, but it's, it's a true freshman coming into a big game. It's a conference championship game coming in for uh, Olave. It was, it was a lot to ask for, but I thought, I thought he was fine. I thought what he did was okay. He was four catches, 53 yards. Uh, Garrett Wilson had a couple of great catches, but also some, some drops as well too. Uh, he ended up with four catches for 49 yards as well. It, it's hard to say without like being able to see the actual 22s because a lot of the mistakes fields made was because he didn't feel like his receivers were open. He was holding the ball too long. Mm-hmm. And how much of that is fields trying to force something downfield as opposed to taking a check down how much of that was the coaching staff not adjusting to the cloud defense that Northwestern was running and running some more stuff underneath. How much of it is a trust as well? How much of it's a trust issue? I think that's Mm -hmm. also another great, great question. And without being able to see actual film and being see, being able to see the actual, you know, what, who was open when, who was the play design? It's it's hard to tell from TV angles, yep. you know, who was and who wasn't at fault. But Fields was holding on to the ball too long. Could that have been the wide receivers who were on the field not getting open? Yep. And by the way, lost in all of the concern about Alave being out, also missing the game was Brian Hartline. Yes. He was contact traced and was uh, presumably by Chris Olave. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, he was contact traced and also missed the game in Indianapolis. So you have one of your two best wide receivers out. More guys down the depth chart who are out. Um, Fleming yeah, there was completely was capable, but was, Jackson was Smith it? and Jimba who I believe is the freshman who's who had been getting the most snaps mm-hmm. to that point, also out. Yep. I think, what was it? It was 22 players who was out, whether it was related to COVID or 
other other injuries. Yes. 22 players and was it four assistant coaches? I, I think it was four. It was two or four. I don't I I, but, I don't remember. But but so you got you got assistant coaches, more so one of your best recruiting coaches <laughs> out for that game as well. Uh, but it, it definitely um you had some other players who did s- step up there. Uh like you said, Hilliard. Hilliard really stepped up in this game here. And what about what about special teams? What about Zach Hoover? Zach Hoover <laughs> <laughs> getting it done on the on this on the punt team there. Yeah. Good job. Good Zach job. Zach Hoover. <laughs> uh all right, defense. Let's talk about the defense here, Jared. Let's talk about the real defense. mixed bag with the defense. Mm-hmm. One. So over. So overall, they let up two two hundred twenty in the air. What was it? Just over a hundred on the ground. I think. Yep, one hundred five on the ground, which I think is fine. They they average three yards per carry, which is a very very typical Northwestern team. If you listen to our um, preview episode, we told you they average about three three and a half yards a carry there so this was very the, typical of northwestern there. this was a northwestern game and ohio state just got to participate in it this was mm-hmm. a northwestern football game now one of the weird things and one of the most disappointing things and one of the things that makes you most nervous for the game against clemson was once again you have a quarterback who's not very good who is just completing passes against ohio state Peyton, Kyle, what did we say in the Know Your Enemy section in the previous episode? He was, Peyton Ramsey was of around 50% mm-hmm. completion yep. percentage for the year. 55%. And did he complete his first 11 passes against Ohio State? Is that right? It was something like that. It was something, something close to that. Yeah, and he ends up now... In the Brawley, second Brawley, half, Brawley, Brawley brings the, up a good point too. Ramsey, I just want to say in the Ramsey. real quick, in the second half, Ohio State's defense started playing a lot better. Mm-hmm. But I'm annoyed by how good they allowed Peyton Ramsey to look in the first half. I'm sorry. What was Brawley I was going to say? Bra- Brawley brought up a good point. If you remember two years ago, um, the Ohio State and Indiana game that Ramsey just tore up Ohio State as well. I'm yeah. going to pull up those stats real quick here. But I, I do remember that it was that was the game when it was um Indiana scored quite a bit of points. It was a it was a really close game in the first half and Ohio State just kind of pulled away in that second half. It was 28 to 20 at halftime uh for that game there. And Ramsey 26 for 49 for 322 yards and three touchdowns. I yeah, feel like definitely, Indiana definitely in tore general, it up there. Yeah, I feel like Indiana in general does that against Ohio State for some reason. <laughs> I don't know. They, they, maybe this is something to talk about going into next year that we have to think about. Indiana just really bringing on the pressure to Ohio State in recent years too, more so than Michigan. <laughs> Indiana new rival? <laughs> I'm not willing to go there. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, Brawley, their leading receiver was um RCB, eight receptions for 103 yards. Yeah, it's the pass defense is what it uh, we've gone over it. They lost and, seven. And, and if you know and if you notice in that game, who did they pick on? Who did they pick on in that game over and over? I mean, once again, I feel like it's easy to rip on seven banks. But without being able to see the all 22s, I know on a couple of those, he was in a complete bailout position Mm -hmm. or he was allowing the wide receiver to run inside without being able to like properly see what the defense was being called. It's it's hard to place blame on an individual because like sometimes it looks like the corner is being beat but sometimes they're just in a complete bailout as far as their defensive coverage goes 
Yeah. And, or is that just a good, good scheming on Northwestern saying, Hey, let's throw it against Ohio state's number two cornerback here. Let's go after him instead. Right. And, but it was also just a lot of high percentage passes. They, Mm -hmm. they knew that Ohio state was going to be in there to stop the run. So the linebackers were playing aggressively, which leaves the middle of the field open, especially on play actions and stuff like that. One of the things that Northwestern was doing and give them credit, they came in with a great game plan. They specifically built an offense to take advantage of the aggressiveness of the Ohio State defense. And the adjustment you see Ohio State make in the second half is to play a little bit less aggressive in the defensive scheme and allowing the plays to develop in front of them a little bit more Mm -hmm. as opposed to completely just crashing the line. Which is why when Northwestern started running screens and reverses and all of these plays that are designed to take advantage of aggressive downhill defenses, Mm -hmm. that's when you had Ohio State's defense start to have a lot more success because they weren't being completely slashed open by, you know, misdirection plays. Yep. The longest, the longest reception was 31 yards. And their second was 20 yards. Everything else was less than 20 yards for that game. Yeah. Uh, let's so see. Defense, sticking, sticking on the defense here, though, Jared, we talked about Hilliard having a really good game there. Yep. He had the, um, he had that inter, not, he didn't have the, yeah. Yeah. He had, he, the, interception um, he had the, the end zone. Yeah. He had the interception. He had the fumble recovery there. Uh, let's see. What did he end up? Yeah. He ended up, with the um, nine tackles for the game there, leading the team um, tied for most tackle for losses. there, just all over the field. And just a great story from Hilliard. He was a five-star linebacker coming into Ohio state, just injury after injury, kept yep. putting him on the sideline finally get his chance here. It's just really good to see that work really pay off for him. Johnny Dixon player of the year. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's the award that we give out. Mm-hmm. Somebody else, somebody else who really um, played his butt off, and we mentioned him numerous of times. And him getting third team is a joke. Haskell, Haskell. Garrett, Haskell yeah. Garrett. I both of the defensive tackles, him and Toji, had, yeah, had really good, good games good game too. and really good seasons. Uh, the defensive ends continue not to get the pass pressure that we are accustomed to at Ohio state. I'm not saying Mm -hmm. they're bad. I'm just saying we are incredibly spoiled by the amount of pass pressure we've received in recent years. And we aren't getting that this year. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. All right. Uh, Let's Um, see. Is it time? Anything, anything else in this game or any player in particular you want to give a shout out to? Uh, man, I feel like we could go on this game all day. Um, red zone, I think, is something we probably need to bring up before we go. It's what cost Ohio State the game against Clemson. And I know uh, the refs cost us. OK, I like I'm not the fumble was what the fumble was. Bottom line is if Ohio State had converted their red zone opportunities. I mean, Ohio State punched. Clemson in the mouth the first half in last year's playoff. Problem was it, the, all those points were field goals instead of touchdowns. Mm-hmm. It was the same with the Ohio State. They they go drive down the dr- drive down the field. I mean, the first play, the first drive here, sixteen plays mm-hmm. driving down driving down the field there. And you only get three points out of that. You eight and a half minute drive. I'm like, this is what Northwestern is trying to do, not Ohio yes. State. But if, once again, this was a Northwestern football game, and Ohio State was just participating in it because that's what Northwestern is. Yeah. Bend mm-hmm. but don't break. Yeah. yeah, and that was a play too. Where and by the way, Northwestern, we're just we're just actually had the touchdown, but then that got the. 
a penalty from Harry Miller, who had a interesting was it Harry game. Miller? He had his. I thought it was the. I thought it was Petit it was Harry, Free. It was Harry. The holding call. Yep, the holding that where Justin Fields went in for the touchdown. That was on Harry. I thought that was Petit Free, but nope. I'll I'll, I'll trust your Harry. memory because my memory's bad. But and by the way, and as far as any of that goes, it was the right call. It was no, no. It absolutely yeah. was. Yeah. yeah, it was the right call. We we can't we can't be all oh the refs on that one. That was the right call. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then and then directly after that, <laughs> Northwestern goes two and a half minute drive for a touchdown too. And we're like, oh boy. Well, they came out swinging there, and yeah. ever since ever since in the second quarter after Northwestern got their field goal, it was just lights out for for Ohio State for the vast majority of the game because in the second quarter here you have Northwestern interception punt missed a field goal interception fumble punt and then to be fair downs. that first interception they had a it was a really nice drive it's not that like was, Ohio yes. State shut them down they that were was, on their was, way that to was the end zone one, until Hilliard made a really mm-hmm. nice interception that was their one really good drive, and and they had the the other other one where they missed a missed a a longer field goal. But that first drive was their really only good drive of that second half. All right, Kyle. Um, I think that's all we can really mm-hmm. afford to talk about time wise. So let's do an ad break with our good friends over at Iron Bean and Mad Canadian. Then let's come back. We'll talk a little bit of national football and more importantly, the playoffs. And then after that, we'll do some ask Sloopcast and then we'll GTFO. All All right. Let's hear from our good friend over at the Iron Bean Coffee Company. Take it away. I didn't know you were going to throw it at me. Uh, (laughs) In the first ad break, I told you why you should buy from the Iron Bean Coffee Company. Veteran owned and hand roasted and roast or all that stuff. Let's talk a little bit about the coffees. Kyle, should I talk about some medium roast or some dark roast? Now let's do some dark roast. Let's do the, the dark, dark roast. roast the darkest of dark roast. In fact, it's a black roast. It's called the Fear No Evil. It's roasted to the brink of flames. It's rich, black, void of all light. Uh, the sheen is like polished armor, and it has the texture of cocoa butter. Uh, the integrity, which is the flagship coffee of the iron bean coffee uh navy no he's a marine marine navy anyway uh the mainstay of the iron bean selection dark roasted uh if you like espressos that might be your go-to uh the drink from the skull of your enemy that's a traditional indonesian coffee edgier smokier uh thick creamy, chocolatey, has, but has notes of cedar, tobacco, wine, and spice. I've not tried one of those yet. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, if you want something that's dark, maybe not quite that dark, there's the Thor, which is a medium dark. There's the medium dark. Uh, thunder, lightning will course through your, bla- through your veins, lead black. I got there. There's also the mm-hmm. Fierce, which is a dark roast. Uh, there's the Rocco, which you can get in a medium or a dark roast. And if you want some flavored coffees, there's also some flavored coffees. A carrot, cake, a blueberry, and a mint chocolate chip. Uh, orders over $50 get free shipping. Gift cards are available, and you can save money with a subscription service. So all of that and more can be found at ironbeancoffee.com. That's Iron Bean Coffee, America's local coffee roaster. This episode is also brought to you by the Mad Canadian Barbecue Company. Mad Canadian wants to let you know that he is currently listening right now. And the pressure is on me to nail this, Jared. So Mad Canadian, head on over to the Mad Canadian BBQ.com. Check out the three great box sets that the Mad Canadian has to offer, including the whole hog, all 14 of the great seasonings that the Mad Canadian has whipped up in his mad lab. You can go with the sweet heat. 
includes four great seasonings, very versatile seasonings, such as the Four Horsemen, the Discord, Old Fashioned, and the Two Border. Or you can do the Just Send It. It includes the s and Bud, the Snore and Heat, the Cajun, and the Smoked. It's a, another very versatile seasoning. It's a all-around great collection and can do just about anything with those seasonings there. Um, be sure to also save even more by using the promo code SLOOPCAST10 at checkout. That is SLOOPCAST10 at checkout for 10% more off your entire order. Be sure to also come out on, Jan on January 2nd at the Finley Crafted Nano Brewery in Finley, Ohio from 2 to 9 o'clock to get some of the Mad Canadian's delicious barbecue and their beer releases as well. Over at the Finley Crafted Nano Brewery, January 2nd. Mad Canadian Barbecue Company, where he has your butt covered. Okay, Kyle. Let's, uh, let's, let's look at some national stuff. More importantly, let's just get straight to the good part. And, you know, the, the final playoff ranking is out. Or yes. the only playoff ranking. This is it. The only we don't one say that the matters. final. It's the only one. It's the only one that matters. It's the only one that counts. Ohio State number three. They did not yep. move up to number three. They did not this. No, they're just number three. No poll before this matters. Ohio State three, take it on Clemson number two in the Sugar Bowl. Yep. And then Alabama would be taking on Notre Dame in the Rose Bowl. Played in Texas. Yeah. Uh, COVID restrictions are heavy in the uh, state of California. So they'll be playing that in Dallas. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing too, you would think that, oh, the home team or the number one team gets to play closest, which would be the Sugar Bowl. Yeah. Well, they came out and said that they decided on the Rose Bowl because the Rose Bowl, I guess the stadium where they'll be playing that, allows for more capacity. So they are allowing more fans to attend, which is why they're giving the Rose Bowl to Alabama. Uh, whatever. I, none of that makes any sense, but I've stopped looking That's the for reason. sense. I've stopped looking for sense and logic from the playoff committee a long time ago, and I'm not going to spend well, any time especially talking if you about keep, it. Especially if you keep looking down in the ranking there as well. Yeah, let's talk about it. Let's get let's get mad about rankings. We haven't done it all mm. year. Let's get mad about rankings. How the hell did Florida not get moved? Listen, Florida after the loss to LSU, they did Which didn't is a bad drop. loss. It's a very bad loss. They were favored very. by 26 something like that. They lost to LSU and they didn't fall very far. And I'll tell you exactly why they didn't fall very far. I'm not the first person to point this out, but I'm telling you right now, this is the answer. They didn't drop Florida all that far because if Florida would have beaten Alabama, they didn't want it to look like an enormous jump to put them up into the playoffs. Because make no mistake, had Florida beat Alabama, then they would have been in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. As would have Alabama. Notre Absolutely. Dame would be sitting yes. at home. And we and we talked about the worst case scenario for Ohio State to really by the way, I be think nervous. They, they would have earned it, by the way. I'm not they mad still would have, but would have make them more nervous is if Florida lost and um and Notre Dame lost here too. That would have been, that would have put Ohio State in a very uncomfortable position there especially yeah. if it was a closer game like if the Florida Notre Dame won. Clemson game was closer it would, it would definitely put Ohio State fans more on uh, Ohio State nervous. was going to the playoff period I, 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 I know yes you you and I sitting here yes yes I we've been saying it been saying it for weeks and months there there mm -hmm. was no doomsday scenario that left Ohio State at home other than Ohio State losing that's it. So I don't I don't mind Texas A&M being there at five, six. I mean, Texas A&M doing what they what they've done all year, minus losing heavily, badly to Alabama. 
Um, Oklahoma move, moving way up was a little was a little surprise, but was it a little bit? They basically when especially, took when, especially when you have an spot, especially when you have an undefeated conference champion who keeps moving down. It seems every week, Kyle as well, Kyle. College football's broken. Mm-hmm. Cincinnati's not allowed to play. I know. Since, They're not since, allowed to play. College football the, is corrupt. College football is broken. I know. Anyone who thought otherwise, and I'm not saying you thought otherwise, Kyle. I know you know better. Mm-hmm. Anyone who thought that Cincinnati had a legit chance to get into the playoffs is kidding themselves. Mm-hmm. Since the college football playoffs have started, Jared. Yeah. Which was since for this is the sixth year. Yes. Yes. Nope. This is the seventh year. I'm sorry. No, this is the seventh year. Okay. 2014, 2020. This is year number seven. There have been six undefeated teams that have not made it to the playoffs. And I'm half just of them go ahead. this year. Half of them this year. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that every single one of them is a group of six team. Yes, they are. Yeah. Yep. Uh, UCF it, twice in back to back years. Back to back years. You know. <laughs> Herbie said at some point during the selection, well, you, you have to, if you're a group of five team, you have to put together a couple years. You have to build up a reputation. Oh, you mean like UCF? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Herbie. Uh, Yeah. You got to put together a couple. That's fair. Anything outside of that. I don't really care too much guys. (laughs) Just, the un, the disrespect that Cincinnati got this year was just ludicrous. Their defense looked really good. Like like in terms of like I would love to see Cincinnati and Oklahoma play. I I really do. Or even since like, let's do even Cincinnati and Texas A and M because Texas A and M fans seem to be just really fed up with Ohio State getting in here. It's Cincinnati strong. and Texas and Cincinnati and Texas A&M. I'd probably take Cincinnati. I really would. Their stout defense that they have this year, mm-hmm. I would take them. Absolutely. Over Texas probably in a close A&M. in a in a close one, but I would take Cincinnati from what I've seen from them this year. Maybe. I like them better just from a matchup standpoint. I like them better against Oklahoma. Mhm. That's just that's just a thought. They get to play Georgia. Yes, so we'll do. see how that goes. I don't Indiana, know, get, it, Indiana getting screwed too. Indiana not playing in the New Year's bowl game. How how screwed are they? Or no, they no, that mean that means there's no Who'd outside of the outside of the um the college playoff. There is no Big Ten team playing. Yeah, but there is one playing in the college. Only three there conferences one, got represented. But there's, there's normally always a second one that usually plays. Who deserved it? And don't tell me it's... Who, who did Indiana beat? Indiana's best win. Don't, and don't SEC me by telling me that they had a really good loss against Ohio State. Because we all know that's crap. We've heard the SEC <laughs> make that argument over and over again. And we always say it's crap, and we say it's crap because it is. Give them a Who shot. Who did Indiana beat? Give no. them a shot. No, they didn't beat anybody. And, all, and by the way, they don't have their quarterback. And that shouldn't play into the decision making, but the fact of the matter is, is that they don't. I think, once again, and Colin and I have been saying it since August, there are three teams. There are three teams, and this has proven to be true once again. One, two, three. All the three teams we are expecting to see. One, two, three. And as we've been saying since August, there's this big glut of teams sitting there in that second tier. And guess what? Texas A&M, Oklahoma, Florida, eh, Cincinnati, you know, showing up in here. Georgia, Iowa State is is showing up in here. But there's this whole glut of second tier teams who I think any of these teams, not Georgia, 
But any of these other teams could have been given that fourth spot. And I would have been like, okay. If that had been Texas A&M or Oklahoma, not Florida, because Florida just lost. Here would have been here would have been something interesting, Jared. What if Iowa? What if Iowa State won? What if Iowa State won? Would they have gone in over Notre Dame? I like to think they would have been. I don't know that they would have been. Mm -hmm. Um, The committee really, really liked the fact that Notre Dame beat Clemson. And by the way, that's an amazing win. I know that there was no Trevor Lawrence. I get it. Mm -hmm. But it was a really good win. They also had a dominant win over North Carolina, who finishes the rankings at 13. Now, should North Carolina finish at 13? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And for those about Ohio State schedule, too. They just beat two teams who are currently in the top 14. Yeah, I know. I, it's it is what it is, man. People are always yep. going to be mad but and they're always going to be upset. It still it still holds true even since the first year, Jared. Don't lose twice. Don't lose twice. That's what it boils Don't down lose to. Twice. Yep. I thought maybe this year could have been the exception. It's Don't not. lose twice and be in a power of five conference. <laughs> Those are the two rules. <laughs> you're you're rolling it a hundred percent click on both of those rules. I thought don't get blown out may have still been in place, but uh, Notre Dame has proven that's not the case. Yep, that's one. We need an eight team playoff, and yes. we need six auto bids. You, you you know it's bad now when we need eight teams. When even Co- Coach Meyer even comes in and says. He kind he kind of he kind of he kind of um, grits his teeth and says it very gently, like, "I think we need eight. Yeah, he says it now because he <laughs> sees Cincinnati, yeah. mm-hmm. where he graduated from. It's one of his two degrees. Mm-hmm. His graduate is at Ohio State. His bachelor's in Cincinnati. Uh, yeah. His good friend Luke Fickle, and by the way, his son." Is a wide receiver on the team. So once Cincinnati, a team that he now cares about, gets screwed out of the playoffs, now he thinks it's time for expansion. Well, you could say the same thing about Kirk. Herb Street? Mm-hmm. What about him? Never mind. We'll move on. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll I can't get here. blocked again. I'll do it. I'll, I'll, what do you want me to say? I'll say it. <laughs> Uh, you care to care speaking of, uh, the team in orange there care to care to comment on what was released as we're recording this on Monday, Jared. Sure. Mr. Mr. Sweeney. So we had, uh, what what, what the hell's he's a fifth year senior. I think we can criticize him. The hell's Demario McCall doing recording stuff in the locker room? That that's a no go zone. You don't do that. That that's against the rules. Mm-hmm. So now everyone, if you didn't see it, Ryan Day was giving a very raw raw speech about how they're going to beat Clemson and beat Bama, and they're going to we only need to beat them once. We're going to beat them once. Beat one or the other bombs. Well, and I don't beat care. one or the other. He didn't. This was before the section. This was after the game. So he didn't know who they were playing yet. Yeah. Point is, is that the Mario shouldn't have been recording. Shouldn't have not have been broadcasting. Uh, that's that goes against all the rules of being on a team. You don't record crap in the locker room. That's that's a no go zone. Mm-hmm. You don't do that. Now, that being said. He said he that they were going to beat Clemson's ass. Okay. And everyone's like, oh, oh, uh, Ryan Day giving Clemson bulletin board material. Give him, oh, all oh, bulletin board material. Look out. Dabo Sweeney ranks Ohio State 11th. 11th. E 11th in his coach's poll vote. So one one thing so the thing that that coach day 
said was supposed to be for private. Yes. He did not the thing say that, that Dabo publicly. did. The thing that Dabo did yeah. was for public. Yeah. That or he forgot. Dabo, Dabo always does that. Always anything that he was, anything that is Good always. God, can you imagine gets, if someone had done that to him? Mm hmm. Oh my God. We would never hear the end of it. If someone did that to him, he understands those votes don't actually help keep Ohio state out of the playoff. Right. Does he, does he understand that? I think he understands that. He hoped. He hoped. There is a reason everyone's like, Oh, Oh, Clemson's going to beat Ohio state. Clemson's going to beat Ohio state. You, you do realize there's a reason why Dabo was lobbying so hard to keep Ohio state out of the playoffs. Right. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned it a few episodes ago too. beginning of the year. He, he sang a different tune. Yeah. A completely well, when, different tune. Because he didn't know how many teams or how many games his team was going to get to play at that time. Mm -hmm. So yep. at the beginning of the year, he's like, oh, it doesn't really matter how many games a team plays. And da, 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 da. But when it became convenient for him to believe something else, he started believing something mm -hmm. else. Because that is what hypocrites do. Mm -hmm. But I will say in his defense... The advantage for Ohio State is definitely there for not playing as many games. I think that's debatable. It's an advantage and disadvantage. There, there is both. Just, but in terms of advantage, in terms of um, rest, is definitely yeah. there for Ohio State. There's rest, and there's a lack of opportunity for injury. That's huge. Well, we, the we other thing too is not as much game film too. Sure. Not as much game film, but also players develop. You can develop in practice. Absolutely. But you need game experience. Yeah. There's a reason why in 2014, Ohio State both lost to Virginia Tech. And beat Alabama and Oregon. Because they mm -hmm. weren't a good team at the beginning of the year, but they were a good team by the end of the year. Yes. That development does not happen like that if you don't play a complete season of games in between. That development matters. Yep. And it has to happen on a field. Mm. Ohio State, look, look at Trey Sermon. And by the way, it, they're it, also missing practice time through all this, at least individuals are, because if you're not allowed to participate in a game because you're on the COVID list. You're also not practicing. You're also not at the facility. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else, Jared? I know we got to move on here. We got some more things we got to cover here in the next seven what? minutes. <laughs> seven minutes. <laughs> oh, Lordy. All right. Yeah. Let's, let's let's try to get some of these ask Sloopcast questions done here. Yeah, we're gonna have to be a little selective. Um, we're not gonna be able to do all of these because y'all brought it uh, with a lot of questions. Um, Kyle, we are obligated via our Patreon uh, website to give preferential treatment to our paying members. So. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, let's try and narrow this list down a tad with our apologies to Young Kids Midwest and Gangland 535 and some of our other uh, lovely Discord members. But let's uh, let's try and stick to our Sloop Cats because it says right there on the Patreon, they get preferential treatment for Ask Sloop Cast. Mm -hmm. All right. Woody G561. Should Justin Fields have taken more ownership of his performance in this post game interview? That's a great question. Um, mm -hmm. Would you have maybe? Yeah, I, I don't know how much I get, man, how much of this is his wrist? When did he hurt it? How bad is it hurt? I don't necessarily want him going out there and throwing himself over the fire because he got hurt. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the exact opposite. Maybe he went out there and he soldiered through and he did the best he could with what he had available to him from a health standpoint. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe. And at that, it's it's a different story. Maybe he just did the best he could do given the limitations of his thumb and his wrist. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, it's it like so many other things when analyzing Justin Fields and this game. If, if we just don't have all the pieces to understand exactly what happened. Yeah. Stewart underscore E4 US vet. Why did Ryan Day continue to try and play cute when we were mauling them at the point of attack? Another great that's question a, there. Something great we didn't question. really cover too much. Uh, when they came back from halftime, they absolutely refocused the offense and <laughs> took over the game when they just basically said, okay, we're a running team now. It was a good, good halftime adjustment there. We always talked about how a state struggling in that second half there, second half in yeah. general, all season, the complete opposite. This game here made some good adjustments and they decided like, Hey, look at this stat where our running backs are averaging over about like, let's see, seven yards a carry, 10 yards a carry. Huh? Let's, let's trust our slobs here to get it done yeah. and pave the way for our, our running back here. I th- also, it's, it's a lot easier from your couch especially you're watching TV, the stats are being thrown in front of your face to see trends like that, as opposed to being down on the sideline. So Mm -hmm. maybe some of that responsibility goes to his support staff for no one saying to him, hey, Sermon's averaging 13 yards a carry and Justin Fields is hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, next next question here, also from Stuart. Is it okay to consider Clemson a rival, even though we haven't beaten them, or are they more of a goal? I think it can be both of it. I don't think that's not an exclusive thing. Mm-hmm. It can be both a rival and a goal. Yes. Do you think we are not Michigan's goal? Come on, they went on the revenge tour. They had an amazing season right up until they played Ohio State. And that was the goal. Yep. It can be both. Uh, Which coach has been the biggest complainer this year and why? (laughs) Dabo, Brian Kelly, Dan Mullen, Jimmy Harbs, or Jimbo Fisher? Um, This year... I would say it's Dan Mullen. Specifically this year, I'm going to take Harbaugh and Brian Kelly off the list. I don't like either of them, but Mm -hmm. we've not heard a ton of complaining from either of them this year. One, because Brian Kelly was good enough. He didn't need to complain. And Harbaugh was so bad that (laughs) what was there to complain about other than Mm -hmm. you just sometimes you just have to tuck the tail. I I think the other three, you could have just, you could pull them and put them all in a hat and just draw one. Honestly, from what we've heard, Dan Mullen in the middle of the year to Jimbo Fisher towards the end of the year and Dabo just being Dabo in general. I I don't think you could go wrong with any of those. If we're we're going strictly on biggest complainer, I'm not going to go Dabo. I'd probably stick with Dan Mullen. I think it was Dan Mullen. Dude, because Mullen Mullen just did not take responsibility when he lost to... Texas A and M. Oh, they had more fans. We need more fans in our in our um, yeah in our stadium. And, and then, then they lost just, LSU. And they lost and LSU. Immediately is just like, well, we had to play so many games, unlike some teams. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I didn't hear. Was there an was there an excuse for the Alabama game? I didn't hear, or I, nor did I care. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So um, specifically within the frame of this year, Dan Mullen, dude, yeah. insi- uh, not insinuated. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, instigated a player fight going yeah. into halftime this season. Yep. That's, that's uh, egregious. See. Will we run or pass more against Clemson? Yes. I want to see run. <laughs> Yes, I want to see us run because of what we've seen from multiple teams. Um, Notre Dame, the first game, uh, Boston College, mm-hmm. also able to run all over Clemson too. 
from what I saw here against a stout defense that Ohio State just faced, mm -hmm. I wouldn't see why not. If they played the way they did in that second half, well, really in general, all game running the ball, I don't see why they couldn't. I think Ohio State can make a lot of ground on the ground against Clemson. Absolutely. Yes. I think that their defensive line is undersized. I think Ohio State can take advantage of that. And quite frankly, in a game where, you know, you might have 80 points scored, I think the over under opened at like 75 or 76 points. Mm -hmm. Shorten the game, take control of the game. Control the clock, keep Trevor Lawrence off the field in a game in which, you know, their quarterback and their wide receivers are outmatching your defensive backs, which is just is what it is. It's, it's a fact. Ohio mm -hmm. State can only hope to slow down Clemson's offense. Okay. Shorten the game, take control, run the ball, run the clock. Ohio State needs to use Northwestern's game plan against Clemson. Yep. All right. Um, what, what next question do you want here, Jared? Uh, we got one from a sloop cat we don't hear a ton from, Tanner Gale. Yeah. He asks, uh, the last time Ohio State visited New Orleans, they beat Alabama in the playoff. The last mm -hmm. two times Clemson played in New Orleans, both in the playoffs, they lost to LSU and Alabama. Just like Glendale is bad for Ohio State, New Orleans is bad for Clemson. Should that give the Buckeyes confidence or is the stadium irrelevant? Do you have thoughts, Kyle? Uh, whatever will help us win. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think and, and so, it's so odd to seeing Glendale is bad for Ohio State in recent years. Yes. But you talk about like the early to mid 2000s. No, Glendale was the second Ohio State home. Yeah. It, it's, it's a shame to, to see that now, but I, I think it should give them confidence. I mean, they, I mean, those players who the players who play there in New Orleans to be Alabama are, are definitely not there right now. The better question is, will Michael Thomas be there at the end of the game handing out wads of cash to Ohio State players? <laughs> He's got to get healthy first. No, he doesn't. Not to hand out wads of cash. <laughs> you oh. still get paid. They wouldn't okay. even allow him to get that close. I've, I today, didn't think OBJ would have been allowed to get that close. In today's age right now. Uh, with the well, age we're living in right now. Well, I don't know. I, I still have visions of Notre Dame rushing the field after they beat Clemson. So Yeah. All right. Austin Formation. If Master Teague comes back healthy, do you still give him the majority of carries or do you have to feed the hot hand of Sermon? Maybe more sweeps for Sermon and more dives and such for Teague and short yardage. Uh, well, first, you can't telegraph where the run is going based off of the running back in the game. Correct. You, you, I, I, I see that a lot. You know, they should only run Teague inside. They should only run. No. I mean, I mean, heck, look, look at North, North, look at Northwestern when they kept doing the Wildcats. Like, oh, I wonder what they're going to do. Yeah, you can't telegraph. The only time you can telegraph a play and get away with it is like a quarterback sneak. That's about it. That or mm -hmm. JTB keeping the ball on fourth or third and three. And you knew damn well, he's going to take the shotgun snap and go and you weren't going to stop him. Yeah. Uh, but more dives, I, I think more dives and such fatigue and short yardage. One thing that disappointed me. Good. Running, yeah. One thing that's really disappointed me with Master Teague this year is I, would really, I really thought he would have, for his size, he would have really bulldozed and like leaned forward more to get those extra yardage with his size. And he just seems to get more stood up more often than not when he gets tackled instead of being able to use his weight, his 
the size that he is to be able to get that extra yard to lean forward. I thought, I think he has been doing better with that later in the season. Early on, I agree with you. And again, like, like Sermon, like so many of the players at Ohio State, he's just gotten better the more yep. games they played. Agreed. So yes. early in the season, I agree with that assessment, but I think he's been getting better at it. Once again, mm -hmm. why it's not a universally great thing that Ohio State's only played six games this year. Just I mean, look I mean, this at the is, running I mean, game. Look at the running mm -hmm. game. Look at the offensive linemen. Look at the two primary running backs and look at how much better. But again, Northwestern's a very good defense. Look how much it? better they've gotten from game one to game six. Who was I think it was Tom Orr. I was listening to Saturday morning, uh, the um, the um, in their morning um, show before the game. I was listening to Tom and Tony and they were talking, they were talking about like this right now, like it's six, seven games. This is like mid, late, no, mid, late October. Yeah. For in, in a typical year. And this is normally about the time when you start to figure things out. It's like, okay, what's working here? All right, how mm -hmm. can we improve on that? What's not working and stay away from that. This is about that time when they really get that figured out. So I'm really interested to see, if Ohio State's really going to continue that trend and keep getting better going into a really big game with some highly touted players coming up here in a few weeks. I I hope so. Um, mm -hmm. Also, during that normal six games, you also haven't had the Woody Hayes closed and yeah. players sent well, home having practices stunted, having games canceled. Players coming in and out and all that. Yeah. It's yeah. just, it's hard to, no, no offense to Tony or Tom, but I, I just don't think it's accurate to simply say, well, six games in versus this six games in versus a regular mm -hmm. season's six games in. Yeah. Uh, Austin also asks us, would you be upset with any Buckeye fans who hate Clemson more than Michigan? No. Eh. Yeah. Here's the thing. The younger you are, the more I'm willing to forgive that <laughs> attitude. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's funny when you look at like generations of fans and like Isla and I are absolutely old enough to remember the nineties, the, the John Cooper years. But I don't know if we were old enough to be scarred by them. Really, to really understand it. <laughs> old enough, yeah, old enough to have experienced it, but not old enough to, like I said, still carry like really mm -hmm. deep scars because of it. To have really, I still, been, I still remember talking to my to my older brother and, and uh, dad, where they'll, they'll even still talk about like that ninety eight year yeah. 98 season yeah 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 and, and yep. yeah that i mean that was one of my first like real invested but yeah mm -hmm. it's um it stinks that the younger you get the less you respect this rivalry and yeah. i you can't blame anyone who is younger than us for not having experienced that in the same way that Kyle and I just didn't experience the, the 10 year war. We, we, we just weren't alive yet. And it's, it's just not, you know, the thing is, is like when, when Kyle and I talk to Tony or Tom, they carry this reverence for the Rose bowl that Kyle and I just do not give a shit about. Oh, well, if this and that, then the Rose Bowl becomes irrelevant. Uh, I don't it's care. It's a pretty, it's a pretty stadium. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, it's just, we don't carry this reverence for it the way people who are slightly older than us carry this reverence for the Rose Bowl. And mm -hmm. it's the same thing with the rivalry. Kyle and I are old enough to have remembered the John Cooper years. And if you're younger than us, 
by five or more years, then you just don't. And because of that, we carry a little extra reverence for the rivalry. And I think anyone who's older than us carries even more of that with them. And anyone who's younger than us feels it less. So ultimately, no, not going to be, we're not going to be upset. Especially if you're younger than us. Mm -hmm. If you're right. about uh, our age or older and you're saying that, then I, I would question your, your long-term, <laughs> your long-term yeah. thinking. But if you're younger right. than us, I get it. One last question from Austin. Was this just another bad game from Fields or does it really show how important Olave is to the passing game? What does he do to the offense schematically and specifically for a guy like Wilson? Well, for one thing, the news got out, uh, at least from a rumor mill standpoint, that Olave was going to miss the game. And it got out mm -hmm. several days ahead of the game. There is a reason why. And sometimes Kyle and I frustrate the, the people in the Discord. And I know that the guys over at the Scoop frustrate the members of that message board for for not talking about injuries and there but there's a reason why we don't talk about injuries because you don't want northwestern to have several days to prepare for there not being chris olave because now they can schematically just take wilson out of the game in a way in a way the the passing attack seemed almost very <sighs> going to hurt a lot of Buckeye fans. 2007, like, when Ginn went down. Oh, I don't, I don't know. If you, your, your whole passing offense just completely changed with your top receiver out. But again, I don't, I don't know how much of this is a lave and how much of this was. I, yeah, yeah, I agree. It, it felt very similar. As the game was going on, it, it started feeling very similar to that. You're holding a ball like this. If any one of these fingers gets messed up, that stinks. If you're this, that's it's messed no, you're, up. You're grabbing. Yeah. That mm -hmm. you, you only got one digit underneath the ball. Yeah. I understand. Hey, Columbus. I understand. Columbus Brewing. I understand. Sponsor us. All right. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Suncard asks, when the Buckeyes go to New Orleans, is there a recruiting aspect to the trip? No. No. No, they, they're, they got it. they're going to be all focused for this game here. Well, we're, we're in a dead period anyway. Yeah. Uh, Brawley asks, what is one game that was canceled this season that you think could have had the most impact if played? Within the context of Ohio State? Or I'm going to take that as just one game in general. I, nationally, I don't, I don't know. Ultimately, like I said, it's it's those three teams, and had there been, I don't know. It one of the reasons I'll say this: one of the reasons why we have three undefeated teams this year who are from the group of six is because they only played within their conferences for the most part. I know the sun card played some big 12 teams, the sun card, the sun belt played some <laughs> big 12 teams. And I know that, um, Louisiana won theirs and, but, but Cincinnati only played within the AAC and coastal Carolina only played, uh, Coastal Carolina play one out of conference this year. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. Point is, is that one of the reasons why you have so many undefeated teams in the group of six is because they didn't play a lot outside of their conferences. Cincinnati, look how good Cincinnati was last year. And despite the fact that they end up losing to Memphis, no one ever took them seriously nationally because they just got boat raced by Ohio State. Mm -hmm. So. Are we having so many conversations about Coastal Carolina and Cincinnati and all of these other group of six teams had they 
potentially, and I don't know what their schedules were like before the, the essence of 2020 happened, but you know, what do we think about Cincinnati for the majority of last year? Had they not been boat raced by Ohio state? Well, speaking of Cincinnati, so what one game, I'll, I'll, I'll extend that to just multiple games back to back weeks with Cincinnati not playing. That could have been, that might have been a big thing of why Cincinnati fell down to them not playing as well. If they play both games, one convincingly in those games, would that have changed no. things ultimately? I don't think no. so, but it would have definitely made it a lot more interesting. No. Maybe, maybe instead of being eighth there, they could have been maybe pushing for that fifth, sixth spot right there. Okay, but they're still not getting in the four. Yeah. What's the mm-hmm. difference between eight and five, realistically? Yeah. A pat on the back. A slightly better get, ball get game. Your, you get your um your 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 Cincinnati right there in the top six there. The first two out, which might help for recruiting, but mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, uh, any uh, other questions we want to try and hit, Kyle? Uh, are there any? I think that's sloop it. Cats we're way over that we missed too. So, are there any sloop cat questions we missed? I think that was it there. Okay. Apologies to everyone else's questions who we did not get to. You guys threw a metric shit ton at us this week. So yes. apologies for that. All right. So this is the only episode for the week here. We're just doing just the Wednesday episode. We'll catch you back here on Monday. We'll review the weekend of any bowl games that would have played. We're not going to try to go over any bowl games because I'm already seeing bowl games being Kyle. canceled left and right here. So yeah, yeah, yeah. but interesting thing though, Jared. Well, next week's our... Clemson pre well are are we doing two episodes next week or are we doing one episode next week? That's a good question. I think we'll do two episodes. We'll do two okay. episodes. We'll figure so, it out. Interesting thing is we'll we really... back on the normal schedule next week. Yeah. So although we might release we're gonna have to the, release that Friday episode early. The CFP committee is allowing to postpone the New Year's six bowl games if COVID nineteen issues occur. So they're All willing right. to push back games well, to make up for this. At least at Ohio State, the campus, the campus is empty at the moment for yes. winter break. That should help with Ohio State. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't, we're going to have to do like a Monday, Wednesday next week, Kyle. Mm-hmm. Something like that. We'll figure yeah. it out. We're not going to release on mm-hmm. Friday. We're going to have to move that episode up. But um, just keep an eye on our... We'll, we'll let you know on Monday what we're yeah. doing. Yep. And for Kyle's corner, I did not fit. I did not forget Brawley. This was in my. This was in Kyle's corner. You're fighting Buckeyes, defeating the UCLA Bruins over the weekend as well. They they beat UCLA seventy seven to seventy. Definitely um, game that I missed watching, <laughs> watching um, football and all that. So I didn't get to watch the game unfortunately i was kind of watching it on twitter but definitely definitely a big win there you, you beat ucla there that's that's always a a very solid out of conference win there kyle we just got a new uh we just got a new patron a new sleep cat Did just we? joined Did literally we? 18 minutes ago patrons. jason wittenmeyer has ah. joined the ranks of the sleep yes. cats and by the way, as Kyle pointed out, the Sloop Cats are able to listen to this episode live as we are recording it. And you can too if you go to discord.thesloopcast.com and only the patrons get to do the live listen ins. So if you want to become a patron, go to patron, patreon.thesloopcast.com and uh, go to thesloopcast.com. If you're looking for any of those links, or any of our merchandise links, where you can buy this lovely blanket back here, uh, and you can find links to our sponsors. Uh, no, no links to Kyle's dog. He's attached. You can't have him. Nope, you can't have him. Nope. But you can find a lot of other cool stuff at thesloopcast.com. 
Kyle already did Kyle's corner. Uh, so I guess it's up to me to do music now. Uh, tonight's ending music will be by Columbus based singer counterfeit Madison. So you can check them out. Uh, there'll be info down in the doobly do. If you'd like us to do this episode. Uh Oh, connection unstable. Nope. We're back. We're back. Uh, if you'd like us to do this episode five days a week next football season, we have a Patreon goal in place to help us make that happen. And we'll also add a second episode during the off season, but we need to hit that financial goal first to find out more. Please visit patreon.thesloopcast.com. And with all of that being said, I'd like to encourage everyone to drink local beer, listen to local music, and of course, support your local podcasters. Once again, this is Counterfeit Madison. What's up, YouTube? Yo. Hopefully this... Leo decided to join us late. Did you see early in the show we had an LG sighting instead of an Apollo sighting? We did. She got up on my lap. Nope. They're adjusting to the new studio too. We, I, I brought dog beds. <laughs> although I think LG went upstairs. We do still have an Apollo down here, although he's asleep. So the, the just if anyone's worried, the new podcast studio has dog beds in it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hopefully this all recorded well and everything. This is a brand new setup, brand new computer, brand new um software brand new mm. everything so hopefully this all went well and if there's any audio issues we will do better next time and i apologize <laughs> and uh i think that's it i think it's uh time to rejoin our audio listeners once again would like to thank counterfeit madison for ending today's show and I'd once again like to thank the Iron Bean Coffee Company for sponsoring today's show. The Iron Bean Coffee Company, uh, I already told you why you should buy from them. They're a Ohio-based, veteran-owned, marine-owned, mom-and-pop, micro-brew, small-batch brewing coffee company. They don't roast the beans till you order them. We, we already had that conversation. I'm going to tell you about the dark roast now. I told you about the Rocco. The Rocco is a gentle, distinctive version of the classic American breakfast cup, a Brazilian yellow bourbon coffee bean with, super with superb smoothness and flavor. Uh, actually, I just read the ride or die. <laughs> that's, that's the ride or die I just read. I don't know what the heck just happened. The Rocco. Uh, he is a unique, uh, Ethiopian natural. It's, uh, for those who enjoy coffees that insist on being noticed, that's the Rocco. That one's available in medium or dark. I just accidentally read you the ride or die, which is a medium. Uh, that one's available in K cup. So is the fierce, which I told you about in the first ad read. And the Rage Against the Dying of the Light, that's another amazing uh, medium roast that is available in K-Cup. Uh, this one has notes of cherry, milk chocolate, orange, and a slight hint of rose petal. This all sounds amazing. So if you're a coffee snob or if you have a coffee snob in your life you'd like to buy some coffee for, please visit ironbeancoffee.com once again that's iron bean coffee america's local coffee roaster this episode also brought to you by the mad canadian barbecue company mad canadian barbecue company is heading on out to finley crafted nano brewery this january 2nd from 2 to 9 o'clock that is saturday january 2nd at the finley crafted nano brewery to get some of that delicious barbecue of the Mad Canadian Barbecue Company. If you can't make it out there, well, you can still get the great seasonings over at the Mad Canadian Barbecue Company.com. Be sure to use the promo code SLOOPCAST10 at checkout. That is SLOOPCAST10 at checkout for 10% off your entire order. Not sure what to get? Get one of the great um, packages that the Mad Canadian has. 
He has the Just Send It, the Sweet Heat, and the Whole Hog, which consists of all 14 seasonings of the Mad Canadian. Mad Canadian Barbecue Company, where they have your butt covered. <laughs> 